this session is five things to do in teams. Or five things to do when presenting in teams to warm a frigid audience. You are in the right place if that is the session that you wanted to see. It is just after 7 a.m. on this cold Chicago morning. I am Heather Ackman, and in this session, five things to do when presenting in teams to warm a warm a frigid audience. We're going to be talking about a variety of different things. Um, but before we get started on that, just a quick little Teams refresher. I don't know how familiar you guys are with Teams, but this is the refresher. Um, if you can't hear me, um, please type something in the chat window. I don't have a moderator currently in the window, so I will be checking the chat ever so often to make sure that all of you guys are with me and uh, don't have any issues. Um, if you want to speak up, I have allowed the microphone so you can say something. If you have a question or a comment that you'd like to add, feel free. Um, uh, let's see. If you want to use, um, uh, if you if you want to share your video, I, I do have like um, portions throughout the um, slide where I ask questions and we have opportunities for a group discussion, feel free. But do keep in mind that this is being recorded for YouTube. So let's keep the chat family friendly and that discussion. And if you do have something to say that you'd like to con contribute, uh, feel free to raise your hand in that little chat. And of course, the keyboard shortcut for that is Control Shift K. That will raise and lower your hand in teams um and yeah if there is a moderator in here and you'd like to assist feel free be be my guest i i will take any help that you guys like to to, to have i always like an extra pair of eyes um if you see a comment in the chat and i am busy talking feel free to unmute and shout out that question for me i would love that help so yeah um Let's get started with uh, just a quick question. I'm really, really curious. How many of you in um, just the past couple of years have upgraded the equipment that you use for meetings or presentation just in the last couple of years? Really, really curious. You can do a thumbs up, a heart, a show of hands, or just even tell me in the comments or unmute and tell me. Thomas says not much. Anyone else upgrade anything? Okay, Pranam says they have mostly two large 32 inch M curve monitors, Thomas. Okay. Anyone upgrade anything like a microphone or a webcam? So far, we just have monitors. Microphone, webcam, 28 inch monitor. Okay. So a few things. We built a meeting room to facilitate virtual meetings. That's a major upgrade. So that's at the business that you worked at. So Antonio says laptop and external monitor. OK. We're getting some thumbs up on some other questions. Yeah. Okay, I personally just moved into a new house uh, about over the summer and um, I know like, you know, I, I make computer training videos for a living and we always try to use like a percentage of the profits um, to upgrade equipment over time. And this year we just decided, you know, we, we should probably 
upgrade some of the equipment. And so like kind of what you see around you, I've got um, a shotgun mic and we've got some lights that we've we finally put in here. Um, but that was like the, the recent purchase um, just for some videos and some of the webinars that we've done here. But yeah. OK. But before we begin talking about the top five things to do when presenting in Teams, I think we should also start with talking about communication, specifically communicating in virtual environments, which I've been thinking a lot about lately since um, I was going to give this talk. And with the holidays just passing in um, this new house, um, I was hosting for the holidays for the first time, uh, my parents came out to dinner, um, which got me thinking about my dad. And, you know, at the same time, I was thinking about virtual communication, which hit me. Communicating in virtual environments is kind of a lot like talking with my dad. When road tripping, you know, um, I, I often asked my dad if uh, he needed to use the rest area and he'd simply say, I'm good. But he also uses that phrase at other times, like when walking alongside him, I, you know, watch him, you know, use the walker. And sometimes that walker would get out a little bit too far ahead of him. And it almost like looked like he'd start losing control. And I, I'd ask him, are you OK? Um, do you need help? And he'd say, no, I'm good. Sometimes even just before he would fall down. And. He'd also use this phrase just before or after um, he'd say, you know, he'd say, I'm good um, at a really horrible time. Um, this came out of his mouth after he collapsed and fainted while he was having a heart attack. Um, I, I was on the phone with 911 and he was arguing with me while on the ground that he didn't need to go to the ER all the while insisting he was good. So how is communicating in a virtual environment like communicating with my dad? Well, there's a lot of nonverbals that are needed to inter interpret the true meaning. That verbal I'm good isn't the entire picture. In, verbal, in virtual environments, we often have little information to go on or about our audience. You know, I live in, in like, um, in person, in person settings, and a lot of pre uh, presenters are usually accustomed to adjusting their presentation or their delivery style based on people's reactions and their emotions from little nonverbal cues, a head nod here, a smile there, or a confused face. But we're missing that in the virtual environment. Um, sometimes the signals don't really match up with reality even when we do get something there's a pause and an answer we have to wait there's a lot of things and that can really throw off the pacing um so much so that by the end of the presentation or the end of the day we all just feel exhausted and emotionally drained from all the mismatch of stimuli and effort on top of that virtual environments limit and distort sensory input Sensory input is a crucial component of communication and the shared social experience of a learning environment. The sensory input we do have access to within a virtual environment is contingent on whether or not a webcam is on, a mic is on, and even then it's flawed because it's an incomplete representation of the participant's environment and experience. We're only seeing or hearing a portion of that person's environment. Not only that, the image we are seeing isn't instantaneous. There is always this slight lag or delay, and that image is often larger or out of proportion um, compared to other participants' faces. 
According to the article, Nonverbal Overload, a theoretical argument for the causes of Zoom fatigue, author Jeremy Balenson proposes that a potential cause for fatigue may lie in the nonverbal overload inherent in video conferencing. Take this image, for example. Now, this is just a stock image. It's not really reality, but it does illustrate Balenson's point that if everyone turns their cameras on and they are sitting in front of, say, their laptops, they are sitting really, really close to their cameras. And if we were to compare the virtual interactions like this to those of face-to-face -face interactions, the fact remains that in a virtual environment, the size of someone's face in a typical Zoom meeting scale, excuse me, scale to that of an in-person interaction, that person would be standing 13 centimeters or about five inches away from you. That is really, really close. So basically, everyone in virtual meetings is a close talker. And that's just because of how the system is designed. Not to mention, it's a little creepy, uncomfortable, and intimidating to have these impossibly attractive people make intense eye contact with you for hours on end. And that is the reason why Microsoft has designed special views such as the together mode. It's to create a more natural face-to-face -face distance and a more realistic environment between meeting participants and the presenter. And realistic, that's a relative term. But there is some research out there to support the use of together mode to combat fatigue. Now, um, do check out this article on Microsoft.com titled Bringing Us Together, particularly the section on uh, better to, titled Better Together on Brain Activity. You can simply go to Google and type Bringing Us Together, Microsoft Together Mode, and you should be able to find that article. It's really a fascinating read. Now, I don't want to talk um, strictly about features this entire time, but um, do you guys have any questions so far? Good. So all of these tips are about ways of communicating and connecting on a human level in an environment that is constantly changing. So the next five tips, um, they're pretty solid tips, um, regardless of um, well, really what system you're using but I will try to tie in some team specific features and highlight those real quick. So here they are really quick, and then we'll go back into each one and talk about them. So tip number one is to talk with your audience, and that's opposed to at or to, if you can. Tip number two is to be accessible. Tip number three is to be genuine. Tip number four is to tell stories. And five is to seek feedback from your audience early and often and to listen. So starting with the first one, and that's to talk with your audience. So in teams and other platforms it's really easy to like throw up a presentation and just start talking um and what i mean by that is it's really easy for one person to start talking and to get into presenter lecture mode and 
a lot of people tend to formalize the language in such a way where it's this higher than life separated from the audience kind of world. And they forget that they're speaking with people and you know it it's it should be it should sound like a conversation or a dialogue even if there's not that much opportunity to go back and forth oops i just jumped ahead okay so as much as you can, you want to try to encourage a two-way conversation with your audience as opposed to that one-way lecture. And I do realize that that isn't always possible depending on the environment or the format of the presentation. So for example, if you are presenting to a general audience of 500 people, you don't always want to tell them all to turn on their microphones. That would just be inviting chaos and well, it would be bad. Um, you also have to consider the format of the presentation. So I'm comfortable asking you guys um, to turn on, like I'm, I'm comfortable allowing mics to be turned on with you guys. You know, we're a small intimate crowd. Most of you guys understand the conventions of, of this place um, and you know, it's being recorded for YouTube. Um, so you, I, I gave you that warning ahead of time and I, I, I think I can trust you guys to follow the conventions of that pretty well. Um, an audience of 500, probably it gets a little dicey in, 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 that, in those numbers. But I can't exactly um, just let it be a freestyle conversation the entire time either. Um, then there's also etiquette to consider too. At some companies, you would never interrupt, say, the CEO in the meeting um, and ask a question, no matter the, the size the of the company. company. Oh, question? question? Okay. <laughs> And at some companies, um, that's perfectly fine. So assuming that the situation warrants it appropriate to have a conversation with your audience, that can certainly limit fatigue and help your audience retain and engage with the material better. Um, as for current features that encourage the audience conversation in Teams, these are the top one. You can choose to enable, enable audience microphones. Chat, that's ideally moderated. If you've got a moderator, they can um, you know, read it or that. Um, there's that Q&A add-in, that I really like, um, if that's possible. And of course, there are breakout rooms that will encourage conversations among participants. We have a comment here. My coworker and I do a series of Ask Me Anything style sessions on M365, Power Platform, and Teams. I always sign in 10 minutes early to start what we call the pre-show, where I chat with the audience, tell about how cold it is here, joke around, et cetera. It sets the tone for the session. I, oh, I always love that. I love starting class early. I love doing the warm up with the audience beforehand. Most definitely love that. Yes. Which brings me to other questions. What is your preferred method of sharing in Teams meetings? What do you guys do? What do you like to do?
Another comment here, we give them the option to ask the question in chat, raise their hand, come off mute, all good things. We have another fan of chat here. Daniel says chat or raise hands. And it does seem like the people in this room seem to prefer the chat. And if you're watching this on YouTube, tell me in the comments what you prefer. For tip number two, be accessible. This is another thing that there's a lot that you can do to be accessible. We cannot cover everything you can do to add accessibility to your presentation here, but here are what I would consider the bare minimums for accessibility for your presentation. So before your presentation, if you are presenting with slides, make sure your slide text is visible. Now for that, you want to make sure your slide text has a good contrast ratio. You want to make sure if you've got a dark background that your text is light enough to be seen, or if you have a light background that your text is light enough to be seen. And there are um, color contrast checkers that are online, but if you're working in PowerPoint, the way to check the colors, there's either like this copying and pasting of like the RGB or the hex codes back and forth, you've got to take a screenshot of the picture, and that's just sort of a pain. What I love is an add-in from, um, uh, it's called the Bright Slide PowerPoint add-in. It's from a company called um, Bright Carbon. If you go to their website, download the Bright Slide, it's called the PowerPoint Productivity Add-in for PowerPoint. It's absolutely free, which is amazing because it does so many things. It adds this Bright Slide uh, ribbon to your interface and it has this really really cool awesome section that um, where you can um, add this color contrast report and inside that report excuse me you can um, basically just click once and in a matter of seconds it analyzes your theme colors and generates something that looks just like this. So off to the left side of the screen, it's showing you everything, every single color combination that passes the web content accessibility guidelines um, for level AA. So that means a color contrast ratio of at least 4.5 to 1. So everything over on the left hand side that is not shaded that gray, that white color, that's something that you could use in your PowerPoint deck and meet that guideline. Everything on that right hand side of the report under the fail category, that is something you should avoid uh, using in your PowerPoint deck. And this will work for any theme, any template that you have. You just press that little button and whoop, it's like magic. So this is something that I use with every single template any company hands me, run that report, and then this is my cheat sheet for what colors I can use when I am building my deck out. And it just sort of tells me what contrast I can use. Another thing, that you should be running with some regularity before you run any presentation in 
live or in Teams is running that accessibility check checker. I know the accessibility checker in the past, you know, it was it was okay. It, you know, would check and highlight things, but Microsoft has spent a lot of time improving this tool. And if you haven't used it lately, you'll be impressed with what they've done with it. There's a lot more tips, a lot more tools, a lot more errors, a lot more warnings, and a lot more tips for what you can do to improve your deck. And I went through and I created a bunch of stuff, didn't really make anything to it, and uh, it just gave me a whole lot of suggestions. One thing that PowerPoint does now um, that's been doing for the last couple of years is anytime you insert any image, it automatically generates something called alternative text. So it analyzes the image. If you've um, got a, a Microsoft 365 subscription, it's um, going to analyze that image and make a suggestion for what that um, alt like kind of analyze uh, what that image is and make a suggestion for uh, what's happening in that image. And it's gotten a lot better, And but still, even if it's adding alternative text for you or alt text, you still wanna make sure to double check that suggested alternative text that Microsoft has thrown in there for you. You, well, for example, here is this slide. There's a suggestion here um, that is uh, not, well, great. Um, it says, uh, this This was the picture. It says, um, uh, has a fine description, um, but if you consider the context of the image where I'm asking people, I mean, it just, it just has a woman with a laptop and a camera. That was That was what the description read. But if you're looking at the context of that image, you know, how many of you have upgraded the equipment you use for meetings or presentations in the last couple of years, and think about what that slide was really communicating, it's talk about it's talking about upgrading equipment. So the point it's trying to make is, well, the the highlight or the focus of this image or this slide is really pointing out, well, there's a fancy camera in this image. So we would upgrade possibly the alt text to a person sitting at a table with a computer and a high-end professional camera. So going back to that alt text, the checker is asking me to look into that suggested alt text so I could click directly from that um, accessibility tag and click right to that alt text area and edit it right there on the spot just from that suggestion. So it's uh, not that bad. <coughs> Excuse me. So other things um, besides adding alt text to image and running the accessibility checker other things to that you can do to be more accessible in teams um like during the meeting you want to make sure you are using a good microphone turning on closed captions and you can also um enable and start transcriptions now to talk about these three things for the microphone Good does not necessarily mean expensive. If you are not doing professional videos or voiceovers, there's no need to go out and buy expensive equipment just for a video conferencing platform. I've gotten, I've been able to get really good quality sound with just a simple headset. Um, really, it comes down to um, mic positioning. Like this is just a simple Microsoft headset. And that's, that's really, all most people need for video conferencing. Um, the most important thing for microphone positioning is you just don't want this like right in front of your mouth because that's where you get the popping keys and the plosives, the mouth breathing. You just, you know, have it off to the side. Um, that's usually the best positioning. 
Um, another thing, if you're using a style microphone like that, another great uh, setting to turn on in Teams um, that's, well, relatively new is the noise suppression option. If you're using a headset microphone or any other microphone that's an omnidirectional microphone, those types of microphones are designed to pick up noise from all directions around you. Um, Teams has a built-in feature now that will cancel out a lot of the background noise, but keep any voice. And it's actually pretty good from what I've been able to tell. Um, so the way you uh, enable that, the three dot menu at the very top, that's the, the more actions, click on device settings, and then go to the noise suppression area and just switching it to low or even high if you are in a particularly noisy environment, you'll get pretty good results with that. Now for live captions and transcriptions, uh, by default, the start transcriptions option will be grayed out. In order for end users to use transcription service, the tenant admin will need to turn on the allow transcription policy. Um, but that's still a lot um, easier than most other services like Zoom, for example. Uh, where you need to purchase a third party service like Otter and connect the service to provide both captions and transcriptions in Zoom. Um, captions too, the presenter needs to enable those before the meeting. Um, neither of these are what I would call user friendly. Um, I, I, I'd still like to see a world where the end user truly has control over turning them on and off without someone having to allow them um, for um, true accessibility reasons. The person who needs the tool should have that control, in my opinion. Do you guys, what is your opinion on this? What's on your accessibility wish list for Teams? Voice commands for the user side, interesting. How would that work? Better live captions, preferably multi-language support, yeah. Raise hand. Like just say raise hand and it raises your hand. Hmm. Yes, yeah, shortcuts for the user with voice commands. That'd be kind of cool. For that matter, I'd like motion controls. I just want to be able to raise my hand and it raise my hand. That would be cool. I mean, we got the video on us anyway. Hmm. That's in the competitor's product? What competitor? I didn't know that. So floating chat menu and presenter windows. The mo oh, the motion ones are in the competitor's product. Okay. Gotcha. Either Zoom or Web WebEx. Okay. Hmm. 
Oh, the mesh rollout. Yeah, with the hand, raise hand feature. Okay, yeah. The first iteration. Well, that makes sense. Okay. I hope. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, if you have any other accessibility wish list items for teams, viewers on YouTube, write them in the comments. I'd love to hear them. And there is another uh, channel on YouTube. A friend of mine runs this. Um, this is she. She offers a lot of great tips for design and for presentations. This is the Accessible Design Lab on YouTube. Um, follow her tips if you are interested in learning a little bit more about designing for accessibility. It's a really good channel. Fun to watch. Bookmark that one. And here's where we kind of transition into a little bit more of just some general tips that are a little bit less about teams and more about presenting. Um, so the next tip, be genu genuine. This tip, um, a few years back, um, I opened with, uh, I had a presentation that just really, really, really didn't go very well. And I chalk it up to a really bad joke that I opened with. And it wasn't like, you know, in poor taste or anything. It's just, it's, it's a joke that just bombed and it just sort of set the bad tone, you know, like, um, I, th I think it was Greg mentioned how, you know, you chat with people in the very beginning, and it kind of sets the tone. Well, some things you can just say wrong at the beginning and it sets a negative tone too. It can backfire on you. And that's totally what happened during this presentation. And so I told this like, just sort of like joke that, you know, bomb, you know, they always say, tell a joke at the beginning, you know, let them set up, like, no, this one bombed. And it just set the, a really negative tone for the rest of the presentation. So much so that I couldn't really get the audience back after that. And the joke was in such a way that it, it made me look kind of arrogant and full of myself. And I saw it on their faces and I just, it just, I, uh, it threw me off personally as I was talking, so much so that as I was demoing stuff, I got tripped up and like I kind of forgot what I was talking about and I forgot what I was demoing and like I couldn't recover from it. And when I, you know, like it just started spiraling after that. And I just, uh, it was just a really, really bad presentation. Like we are talking flop sweat bad. And I just, I just, uh, it was awful. And it took me so long to recover that I was just like, I, it was awful. It was so bad. We all have bad days. You know, we have the bad sessions that we just can't like, bleh. anyway. So yeah. Um, it was it was like about I think like a month before I could even bring myself to read the feedback from that session. But I'm really glad I did. You know, it was it was brutal. I mean, they were really they tore me mm, tore me apart in the feedback. But I'm glad I did because um, once I read between the lines, cleaned up some of their phrasing to make it kinder, it amounted to that I needed to work on being more genuine, which is really good advice. But being genuine, especially showing your genuine self in these difficult times, sometimes that can be a really hard thing to do. We've all gone through some very challenging life changes and adjusting to a virtual remote or asynchronous communication is just one small aspect of it. Now in Teams, there isn't really a tool to help you be more genuine, but there is something within the UI that can make you feel more self-conscious. 
And this is something that I would love to see maybe change. <laughs> um, that is the preview of yourself. I, I, I know a lot of people kind of like checking to see how they look, but it, it almost becomes a distraction for like some people too, like looking at themselves in that lower bottom corner. Like, especially if you, if you've got, like, I, I use the presenter view all the time and I've got my notes in, in that little window and the view is just right underneath there. It's hard not to look at, cause you know, the motions there. Um, but yeah, there's actually been studies of that and seeing yourself constantly like that mirror reflected back at you does cause like depression and um, kind of like lower self-esteem. So it, it, I, yeah, and it, it's, it's not good to have that staring back at you all the time. So that is kind of interesting. But anyway, what about you? How, how do you feel about seeing yourself when presenting? Would you like the option to disable the mirror view of you? I'm very curious. I cannot be the only one. Oh yeah, Dan okay, great. Someone agrees with me. Yes, I would love that option. Did any of you guys, oh, I turn my camera off when I'm presenting, oh, okay. See, it's not great to turn your camera off when you're presenting because some people do rely on reading your lips when you are talking. So that's actually an accessibility thing too. So here's the thing. Do you guys remember? I, I don't know if you guys ever used PowerPoint. I think it was like a few years ago. Like there was like the PowerPoint recorder, an early version of it. You had the option to record like yourself, but you had an option to turn off the preview of yourself as you're recording. I went into PowerPoint recently to use the recorder and they took that feature away. And I was like, why did you guys do that? That was the, I loved it. And I'm like, I wanted that in Teams and now it's gone. And I'm like, why are you taking good features away? And that was just one of them. So yeah, but I, I want that back and I want it in Teams too. Send the feedback. So people on YouTube, would you like that option as well when you are presenting to hide your the preview of yourself? I want to I want to know. I cannot be the only one. Oh, and Greg says one of the competitor companies allows you to remove your video from showing. See? I'm telling you. All right. And the last one, tell stories, number, or not the last one, number four, tell stories. Stories are memorable, relatable devices, regardless of the speaking and delivery medium, but they are especially important in an virtual environment where sensory input is limited. Stories can help fill in the details that are missing from the online environment if you fill that story with plenty of sensory language. So to illustrate that, let me show you what I mean. My husband is a professor at a large university downtown. And at the beginning of every semester, they gather all of the faculty for these marathon all day department meetings. Now I'm told they're not only brutally boring, but also so very uncomfortable. It's the underfunded English department. So they all sit in these broken down metal chairs. The floors are concrete, the room is too cold. And to keep them in the meeting longer and to maximize efficiency, they have it catered from their cafeteria, cold, ham, sandwiches, no vegetarian option. Oh, and this is no browned Thanksgiving ham your mama used to make. No, this is processed, drippy, slimy, deli 
ham. This was the very ham tray my husband was sitting by on the afternoon I called him frantic when my daughter came home from school with head lice. And I asked him to come home to help clean the house, bathe the cat, and shampoo and brush hair. No, this was not a good day. But you know what? He was happy to have that excuse to leave that meeting. So moral of the story is, long meetings are expensive and are really not that effective. So keep it short. <laughs> anyway. So you can kind of see there like what I tried to do um, with the story getting to the point of really bad meetings. You know, people just want to get out of there no matter what horrible reason is awaiting them at home. But anyway, use a lot of language descriptors or whatever. If you want to learn a little bit more about how to tell better stories, there's a lot of really good books out there on telling stories and using telling stories. This is a great book to start with. Um, Nancy Duarte's book called Resonate. Um, if you want a preview of some of the things that she talks about in that book, there is a TEDx talk um, that talks a little bit about the structure she talks about in that book. Um, the talk is called The Secret Structure of Great Talks. It's a great TEDx talk. And of course, I love Nancy Duarte. She's awesome. And of course, the last tip is to seek feedback early and often and listen. And that is to, of course, check in with your audience, ask them frequent questions, ask them how they're doing, give them opportunities to give you feedback, to ask questions, and of course, to give you feedback. So no one can improve without the opportunity to give you their feedback and provide it. So here is the feedback link for the feedback for this session. Please fill that out. And of course, one at the end of the day for the conference itself. We are partnered with a great charity, the Children's First Fund. They uh, do a lot of things for the Chicago area. First and foremost, they support the Chicago public schools, but they, through their Compassion Fund, they also provide um, a lot of as needed support for families, teachers, um, families of children, uh, especially throughout this pandemic um, with a lot of families, um, a lot of children e-learning. That means a lot of parents are having to take time off from work to be home with their kids, to supervise them throughout the day, which means a lot of parents are not getting paychecks as a result. And the Children First Fund makes up for that by taking care of bills, electric bills, food, clothing, you name it, whatever that relief needs, Children's First Fund makes up the difference. Um, they also provide electronics, Wi-Fi to areas in need that don't have high-speed internet um, to children who need to connect to their schools. So it, it re they really do a lot for Chicago, Chicago children. So do please donate if you are able to to the Chicago Public Schools. They need it. And of course, a big, huge, massive thanks to our sponsors events like this would not be possible without them. And while you're here, we have some raffles and giveaways. We are having a Twitter giveaway. We are having an opt-in registration raffle. Check in back at 5.50. I know it's a long day, guys. If you are able to, to see if you won the opt-in raffle. And of course, we have a partner raffle. Um, submit your par partner raffle entries to the link on the screen. Thank you, sponsors. And of course, what questions do you have for me? You have like a minute left.